let's look at the Eighth Commandment. The Eighth Commandment is, very simply, you shall not steal. Now, the emphasis in the Eighth Commandment, as we look at it from a positive perspective, is on stewardship. We see this in Psalm 24, where we see that the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The idea that God owns all things. It's not ours, but we are stewards over it. And so we are to take care of those things that he has given to us. Likewise, in Genesis 1, 28-30, where we read that God gave man dominion over the earth, this implies that he has control, that he is to rule over it, and so we are stewards of all that exists. And see, this is the concept then of stewardship and the idea that we see in the Bible instead that wealth is a blessing from the Lord. That it is something that God gives us as a blessing. You look at the saints of the Old Testament and you see that Abraham was very wealthy. David was wealthy. So that wealth in itself is not a sin or having wealth. And this is contrary to what is being told to us today uh, in our culture. But wealth in itself is not a sin. Now there are spiritual dangers in wealth. Uh, Solomon, in Proverbs 30, asked that he not have either too little or too much. That uh, he might, if he had too little, he might be tempted to steal. If he had too much, he might be tempted to deny God. So there is a temptation with wealth, but there's also a temptation with poverty. We can then be tempted to envy or covetousness. Now, we have to see then that the Eighth Commandment implies non-socialism. Okay, Think about it this way. If property is held by everyone, if we're in a socialist society where we say there is no private property, all goods are public goods, if that's the case, how can there be theft? If I see somebody's car that I like, and if it's really everybody's car, then it's not stealing for me to take that car. And then this commandment becomes meaningless because it's impossible to steal then. Now, we think about New Testament examples, and people will bring up, okay, Acts 4, where you had the disciples sharing with one another and having all things in common. But the point is that in Acts 4, it was a voluntary sharing you know, the situation of Ananias and Sapphira when uh, they were confronted about uh, their own uh, actions. Peter said, while it was your own property, it remained yours, and you could do with it as you chose. That uh, this was not forced sharing. It was communal. It was showing love towards one another. We should share with those in need but not through a forced government system. You see, the government doesn't cause us to share. The government forcibly takes from us and gives to others. Now, in, in terms of the Eighth Commandment, in terms of this concept of wealth, there comes up the question about uh, the stock market. Okay, what about the stock market? Isn't that just greed? Or isn't it just gambling? You hear people saying, well, I don't want to gamble on the stock market. Or if you invest money in, the, in stocks, you're just, it's just the same as going to Las Vegas. I want to think about this a little bit uh, because I think we can look at it biblically if we just understand what's actually happening. Now, the fourth commandment requires diligence and work. Okay. I mean, the fourth commandment does. Uh, the fourth commandment we read, you know, six days you shall labor. And so we have to work hard. But now work isn't just limited to physical labor. You see, if we have money, we talk about putting our money to work by investing it. Okay, let's say that I see that a friend of mine has a good idea for a new tractor. Okay. And so he needs money to develop it. Well, I could lend him 
several hundred thousand dollars to produce and sell it with the idea in mind that okay after he makes a profit then he'll pay me back with interest and so on and I'll profit from that but let's say I don't have two hundred thousand dollars to lend him but I go out and I find two hundred people who will each put up a thousand dollars in my friend's business that's what stock is they have bought partial ownership in that business and so let's say then that his tractors are really profitable and his two hundred thousand dollar business is now worth three hundred thousand dollars now those two hundred shares that were purchased for a thousand dollars are now each worth thirteen hundred and thirty three dollars see there's been an increase that's how the stock market works now the thing is though that not only is my friend working by building tractors and so on but all the investors are working because they're supporting his work he his work my friend's work would not be able to exist if the shareholders didn't put money into it so their investment is work in that it supports and enables profitable work to, to take place and so see this is how we look at those who invest money they are doing real work they are supporting those who work and if we confiscate their money from them they're not able to support businesses that are doing work okay now you also see here how it's inaccurate to say that if you invest in the stock market you're betting on the stock market as it's as if it's a game of pure chance now it might be that I don't personally know much about my investments you know I invest in say Apple stock Apple computer just because I might like Apple computers and I don't know much about the company and how it's run and that type of thing but someone does know about that or I put my money in mutual funds and I have no idea what stocks are in that but somebody does have an idea of what's going on my stockbroker the mutual fund managers or something like that it's not a game of random chance as to whether the stock goes up or down it's based on real factors even if those are unbelievably complex factors and the root of the stock market is companies that are doing real work real productivity producing real goods and services now let's think about the issue of gambling okay and I want to look at this and this is something where honestly you may disagree with me and that's fine and I'm not this is not something that I'm going to say well this is the absolute truth and this is not something that I'm willing to die for if you say no you shouldn't believe that okay that's fine but let's think a little bit about gambling gambling just as a definition okay it's playing a game for money but it in excludes people who pay for play for salaries like professional ball players I mean they're not gambling even though they're playing a game for money it generally involves games of chance now you know as Calvinists we don't believe in chance ultimately but when we talk about chance in this setting we're talking about games where the outcome is not really an issue of skill okay which cards are dealt to you has nothing to do with the skill of the dealer or anyone else at least if it's not a rigged game if it's a tr fair game then the dice coming up with a certain number is there's no predictability there's no skill in that uh, now uh, as I say this might be controversial and don't violate your conscience but at its root I think gambling can be seen as a form of entertainment okay now let's say that I get together with some friends to play a game of risk now we could play without involving money and that's fine but we could also all say okay let's all put a dollar on the table and the person who conquers the world gets all the money okay or people in your office set up a pool for the NCAA Final Four everybody in the office puts in a dollar and the person who makes picks the most games right wins all the money people do this all the time it's just entertainment it's just fun it's that type of thing I can see no ethical difference at root between doing this or taking my family to Six Flags 
When we had children, we'd go out to Six Flags, we'd spend $50 for a day of entertainment. Okay, that's $50. It's gone. Okay, we've had some fun out of it, but the money's gone. Assuming I can afford it, though, I could spend that $50 at Six Flags, or I could go to Biloxi and spend $50 on the slot machines. As long as I stick to my budget and say, okay, there's $50 for entertainment money, I don't see that there's an ethical problem with that in itself. I think about my mother. She used to go on cross-country bus tours with senior citizens. And one time, they went through Las Vegas. The whole group went in one of the casinos. She had budgeted a certain amount of money for entertainment. She played the slot machines with her money, spent her entertainment money, and she left. And she had fun doing that. I simply can't say that that's morally wrong in itself. Now the issue comes though that there are problems often associated with gambling and this is where our consideration of the situation in ethics comes into play and the motive in ethics. What's the hard attitude? For one thing it's easy to become addicted to gambling. This is where the motive comes in. Okay, You go to the casino with fifty dollars and you lose your fifty dollars but you have a hunch that your luck is about to change so you pull out another fifty dollars you lose that. And now you're thinking, well, I've got to keep playing to try to get back to the positive. So you get more money out of your account and you say, I'll quit as soon as I'm back in the black. You see how this works and that's how casinos are set up. The odds are in favor of the house and the more time you spend there, the more money you're going to lose. Okay, So that's a problem. Another problem is that many people who gamble regularly have a get-rich-quick mentality of greed. Again, the heart attitude is the problem. They think, I don't want to go get a job. If I play the horses, if I play the lottery, I'll get rich, and then I can retire to a life of luxury. Think about what Proverbs says about this, though. Proverbs 13.4 says, The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. It's diligence, hard work, that results in wealth, not just wishing for it. Proverbs 28.20, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. We don't believe in get-rich-quick schemes. If you try to get rich quick, you'll find yourself in poverty. Over and over again, the Bible teaches this, that wealth and riches are the result of diligent work. Now, of course, there are exceptions, but the book of Proverbs deals with general principles. And the way things normally work is that those who work hard gain wealth, the lazy and those who try to get rich quick fall into poverty. And think about this too in our culture. Think about people who are wealthy in our culture. I mean, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Arthur Blank. I mean, how many of them got wealthy by gambling? Look at the Forbes list of the 400 richest Americans. None of them are lottery winners. They know that wealth is increased by work not by gambling. So the get-rich-quick mentality is a problem with gambling. Another problem is that gambling often has ties to organized crime, such as the casinos and so on. So overall then, I see gambling like this. I don't think gambling in itself is inevitably sinful, but there are other issues that often accompany gambling and which make it unwise. See, I think there are things we can do which are not wise, but which are not necessarily sinful in themselves. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. I don't think gambling is a wise use of your money, but I can't say it is automatically sinful. I don't believe I can say that if you're on a vacation and you go through Vegas and play the slots that you're committing sin. It's generally accompanied by things which are sinful, such as your attitude. Therefore, it's something we have to be very careful of. And informally getting together and playing penny ante poker is innocent. Spending every weekend in Biloxi and putting your money in the casinos rather than paying your mortgage is definitely sinful. But what about the lottery? Now, I don't. The lottery is just a state-operated form of gambling. And again, as such, I don't think it's in itself sinful. 
you could say it's a form of entertainment. I mean, I have a few dollars to spend as fun money, so I go buy some lottery tickets. Now, I don't see much entertainment value in that, but, you know, it's not like going to Six Flags and riding the rides there, but maybe it is entertaining for you. But again, consider the things that go along with it, addiction and greed. I mean, the state even promotes this idea of greed and of addiction, saying, you know, in, in Georgia here, one of the ad campaigns was, you can live your fantasies. Uh, so that's one problem with lotteries. Another is that it's what's called regressive taxation. See, in our country, we have what's called progressive taxation, our income tax system, where, where the where the more money you earn, the higher your income, the greater percentage is taken out as taxes. Now, we might disagree with that, but it's understandable in some way. I mean, a poor person needs a higher percentage of income to live than a rich person does. So the rich can afford a higher percentage of taxes than the poor can. Okay. Maybe a rich person could afford to pay 75% of their income in taxes. A poor person certainly can't pay 75% taxes. Okay, now, I don't agree with that principle, but it's understandable anyway. But regressive taxes work the opposite. They take more from the poor in terms of percentage than from the wealthy. You see, what happens is that if I spend a dollar on a lottery ticket and somebody who is in poverty spends a dollar on a lottery ticket, he has spent a higher percentage of his income on that lottery than I have. Okay. And there's also the fact that generally it's the poor who play the lottery the most. Okay. They're the ones who are going in and buying hundred, you know, buying a lot, bunches of lottery tickets at a time, hoping to get wealthy all of a sudden. It's the poor who are doing that. Again, it's not the wealthy going and buying the lottery tickets. So, is it sinful for you to buy a lottery ticket? I don't think so in itself. Now, if your conscience bothers you, if you believe you should not, then don't buy a lottery ticket. Okay. And if you feel that it's leading you to greed, to uh, covetousness, if you feel that it's becoming an addiction, then stay away from it. Okay. So, that's the Eighth Commandment. Let's look now at the Ninth Commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now there's a legal focus here. That's the focus of this. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Strictly speaking, it's a courtroom setting. You're not supposed to lie on the witness stand. Okay, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's the emphasis. But we expand this to apply to all of speech, that there's a focus on honesty. I mean, think about Psalm 15. It speaks about blessings upon the man who swears to his own hurt and doesn't change. He's honest. He sticks to his word. Jesus tells us in John 8:44 that Satan is the father of lies. So that's the emphasis here in the Ninth Commandment. So it also deals with other uses of the tongue, though. Gossip, spreading unnecessary information about others. Slander saying falsehoods about one another, twisting people's words. These are all violations of the Ninth Commandment. Now, what about jokes and lies that are jokes like that? These are not intended to deceive. I mean, when you tell a joke, you're not trying to deceive somebody. They, I mean, they know you're telling a joke. Okay, so it's not, I don't believe that's a violation of the Ninth Commandment. You're not bearing false witness against anybody unless, you know, it's a joke at somebody's expense, something like that. What about polite lies? Okay, you see somebody on the street, and they say, how are you doing? And you say, well, I'm doing fine. You know, even though you might be in pain, you've got a serious toothache or something, but you don't start reciting your medical issues to them. You, know, you just say, I'm fine. See, this is part of social etiquette, and it's just understood as a conventional way of maintaining civility in our culture. This is just being 
polite and kind to one another. Okay, you're not intending to deceive somebody if you say, I'm fine. Now, if you go to the doctor and he asks, how are you doing? And you say, well, I'm fine. When really you've got a pain in your side that's been bothering you for months. Okay, that is not right. You need to open up. You need to tell him the truth. Okay. But just a typical conversation starter, you're not trying to deceive anybody or anything like that. Um, you know, you do get into situations like, okay, there's a elderly person who is uh, in ICU and they're hospitalized. They have tubes running all over them and they're emaciated and they look horrible. You go to visit them. Well, you shouldn't tell them, man, you look like you're at death's door. You don't do that. Um, you also shouldn't say, you know, I've never seen you look better in your life. Okay, You find ways that you can say things that are comforting, that are encouraging, without needing to go into those issues. You think, what is the effect of your speech on the other person? This is where we start thinking about the results or the outcome of our actions. Okay, What is going to build up, what's going to edify the other person? Okay, now we've already discussed the idea of lies in the context of uh, moral situations like hiding Jews uh, in Nazi Germany. Uh, you know, but so you can go back and watch that video if you need to. But uh, I hope this is helpful as far as thinking about the use of our speech in the Ninth Commandment. Now, in our next session, we're going to finish up the Ten Commandments. We will look at the Tenth Commandment. 